Oh man, your pastor is too kind, and uh, I mean that, uh, Pastor Elliot, from literally the moment I had boots on the ground in this town, was one of the first folks to just make me feel home, uh, make me believe that the church community in Lodi uh, could be a community. Uh, You know, when Jesus prayed forward through time for the church in John 17, he prayed something very specific. He said, Father, I, I want them to be one. I want them to be one. So when we do this thing, we're actually living out the prayers of Jesus for the church moving forward. And, uh, and I know that is his and Tiffany's heart. And uh, I'm going to, I got limited time, but you guys came on Wednesday, so you were expecting to go to church. <laughs> and so, so I want to be uh, honoring of, of time uh, and uh, the fact that it's a school night. Come on, I got kiddos. I, at the last second, had to order pizza as I was leaving the house because I didn't realize no one thought about feeding my kids. My wife's at an event. I'm at an event. Like, we're like, oh, we got kids still. We got to feed them because um, it's a school night. And so, <laughs> but, uh, but I do want to just share that, that your pastor, um, you know, my landing in Lodi wasn't the easiest landing. I, I don't know if you've ever come from outside side to inside a town, uh, into a church culture, into some brokenness, and just trying to hear from God and serve at the pleasure of the King. And it's a very, it could be a very lonely spot to find yourself. And, uh, and Pastor Elliot found me in that lonely space and moment and was just an authentic, genuine friend. And I, here, here's how you know that he was that, because when I had like no relationships in the community, I had to miss a Sunday. It's really hard to miss a Sunday when you're just getting started, because you got nothing like behind you to make that go, Elliot showed up and preached and stood in the gap and covered uh, and armor bared me, uh, had no reason to do it other than relationship and believing in the kingdom. And, uh, and so I have been blessed and we are blessed and you guys should know how blessed you are to have a pastor that has that heart, a pastoral team here that has that heart. And, uh, and so it is my, it's my pleasure uh, to come and share with you guys a little bit. And so when Pastor Elliot invited me, he said, hey, just preach one of your favorite stories. And I said, oh man, I love getting into the word of God. And I know because you're here, you love getting into the word of God. And so I wanna get us there. If you got your Bibles, we're gonna get into the book of Judges. We're gonna talk about one of my favorite people in scripture. But I know that when we start talking about Bible stories, um, see, there's a thing that can happen to us especially if you grew up in church. And uh, I call it the lullaby effect. You've heard a story so many times that it's like a lullaby effect happens, right? And what happens is we end up sanitizing the story in our mind because we just want the warm, fuzzy like reality of the end of the story. And we don't want to remember the mess of the real people who were involved. So here's how I know we do that. Because I know that many of you have painted Noah in your nursery before right? And you painted an ark and you put two little giraffes and two little elephants in there, a couple of lions. It was fun. And when you painted that scene and painted the water, you didn't paint thousands, no, millions of people under the water drowning. Like you sanitize the story a little bit, right? Like you, you remember the, the win of the story. And, and, uh, and so when we get into the stories of God, sometimes we can sanitize the story a little bit, but tonight we're going to get a little real. And we're going to get into the the tension of the text a little bit. And we're going to talk about one of my favorite people in the Bible. And his name is Samson. Look at somebody and say Samson. Samson. Now, when you think of Samson, what do you think of when you think of Samson? You can shout at me. I'm Puerto Rican and I'm used to having to be the loudest person in the room in order to be heard, which is why my volume goes up. So I'm comfortable if you talk at me a little bit. When you think of Samson, what do you think of? Strength, yes, right? Basically, hair, yeah. So, so I'm 50% of Samson, right? I'm yoked, but I don't have the hair. Let's go. And so, <laughs> right? So if I were to ask you to draw, draw a picture of Samson, you'd probably draw somebody yoked, luscious. You would draw your pastor. Come on now, that's what you would draw. But, but I want you to think about something when we get into the narrative of Samson a little bit. They were surprised at his great strength. They were surprised. So, so, so I want to break us out of that nursery uh, sanitized version of Sam. Like when I, I didn't grow up in church. And so when I started hearing about Samson, I thought Samson and Hercules were like the same guy. Hercules, Her, right? I thought the Disney version was the version. And so he must be yoked. He must look like my He-Man. Come on now. And uh, I don't know what generation you are, but I was a He-Man generation. And, uh, and so he must look like that. But as I get into the text, I realize they're constantly surprised by Samson's great strength. So, so I just want to start to break your paradigm as we get into the text. Now, as we do that also, when I learned this, 
I learned all about the sin cycle of the book of Judges. Maybe you've heard that before, maybe you haven't. You've heard a little bit about this thing that's happening in the book of Judges. You have this pattern that's being repeated. The people of God are rejecting God, living outside the boundaries of God. Sin enters into the equation. When that happens, the hand and the protection of God is removed. Then outsiders come in and oppress the people of God. They suffer because they don't have the covering, the protection of God anymore. They cry out to God. God sends a redeemer, a judge, a rescuer in his compassion to them. They are, re, uh, they are uh, uh, freed from that oppression. They serve God again until they drift. And, and so when I learned it, I, I was taught, and come on now, in church early on, this is the sin cycle. This is the sin cycle that, that mankind always goes through this sin cycle. We start with the covering of God in our journey, then we reject God, then we lose the covering of God, then we experience the suffering that comes when we reject the covering of God, then we cry out to God and he shows up. And I learned it as the sin cycle. And it wasn't until a couple of years ago that, that I, I realized, hey, you know what? This actually, we, we keep calling this the sin cycle, but you know what I think this is? I think this is the redemption cycle. I don't think this is about man who keeps rejecting God. We know how man works. I think the scripture wants us to know who God is, that God is the God who sees us no matter how many times you reject him, no matter how many times you run, no matter how much suffering has been in your life because you've run from God. If you cry out to God, he will still hear you. He will still send help. He still will reach out. He is the God who time after time time after time, no matter how far you run, no matter how many times you enter into the crazy cycle of, of needing his grace and needing his redemption, his arm is never too short, church. He never fails to reach out and cover us every single time. So that's what's happening in the book of Judges. We're seeing the redemption of God time after time after time on display. And by the time we get to Samson, come on now, say Samson. Samson. Right, We get to Samson, he's the 12th time that we see them go through this cycle. And we're seeing this pattern again and again and the grace of God on display and the redemptive nature of God again and again and again. You know, it's a pretty funny thing how a little compromise can ruin our plans. A little compromise can ruin our plans. I uh, had this very unique privilege back in 2006. I was a youth pastor. And uh, we had put a group together, and we were going to go visit a big church in Colorado and see, like, how the big boys did youth ministry. Come on now. I had a, had a fun chance to do this. I was leading the team, and, you know, we were like, let's go see how the big boys are doing youth ministry, what God's doing at this big church in Colorado. And I, I won't say the guy's name. You may know who he is. But, but the church that we were going to, we had booked a trip to go there. And as we were on our way to go there, the news broke that the pastor had had a major moral failure. Now, this wasn't like a small, low-key moral failure. This was like a very pronounced and public destruction of his life in ministry based on some horrific choices. And this is a guy that was in the news. He stood next to the president and prayed. I mean, this was a, this was a big dog. Dude, we've got a trip booked. I got tickets. I got hotels. Like, we're heading out to see this church in Colorado Springs, and we're like, what do we do? And we call, and I, and I talk to their number two guy there, and he's like, he's like, if you guys want to come, you can still come. And we're like, I don't know if we should come. You know, and I'm like, like, what should we do? Like, I don't want to, like, make this weird or anything, but what do we do? And, and, we, and I, you know, I called the guys. I'm like, let's just go. And so we go. And I walk into this church that has, I don't know, tens of thousands of people. It's huge. And It's broken. And we get a chance to sit down with the number two guy. And the number two guy's name is Rob Brendel. Rob Brendel was a summa cum laude at Duke, a tank commander in the army, and then pastoring number two at this ginormous church, one of the sharpest, nicest guys. And he had written a book called In the Meantime, a great guy. And we're sitting down with Rob Brendel. He's number two. This guy's been all over CNN. I mean, the, you, know, you know, the world loves when Christians mess up. Right? They love pointing out the cycle. Let's go. They don't want to bring up the grace, but they want to know when we fail. He's been all over the news. He's been getting criticized. You knew. You didn't say something. You protected him. All this stuff's happening. I mean, this guy looks like, I mean, he's, he's pretty haggard. 
And we're sitting in a room with him. It's me and about 15 youth pastors. And I wish, oh, I would, the story would be so much better if I asked the question, but I didn't ask the question. Someone way cooler than me asked the question. We had a chance to ask him some questions, and someone just said, hey, Rob, we, you know, we believe you when you say you didn't know what was going on, but can you tell me this? Was there, was there any moment when you thought, if you look back now, that maybe you should have saw something? Something was wrong. Something had changed. And he goes, well, that's the first like, really good question that someone's asked me about this whole thing. He goes, you know what? Here's what happened. We were experiencing so much success. God was so kind to us. So many amazing things were happening. Lives were being changed. Worship centers were getting built. Churches were getting planted. There was so much success that we all of a sudden kind of became cool. And as we became cool, it actually became cool to not be as holy as we used to be. The jokes kind of changed. Things that would have got called out and someone would have said, hey, we don't, we don't talk like that here. Kind of got laughed and, and embraced. And he goes, if I were to go back and point at something, somewhere along the line, a, a little division happened in our heart. We weren't as committed to the things of God as we were committed to the success that we were experiencing. And I think we turned our eyes the other way when things started, come on now, to crack there. See, a little division can take us a long ways away. You know, I was thinking about how if we're, if we're walking with God, but we're just a couple degrees off for a long time, you don't notice. Come on now. But the further and further and further you go, the farther and farther and farther you get away. So today I want to take you into the text. I want to tell you Samson's story. I want to desanitize it a little bit, but I want to get into the mess of what it looks like when you start with vision and you get division and you end up with no vision. Come on now. You start with a vision, then you get division, but you end up with no vision. And this is Samson's story. Samson is what's called a Nazarite. Say Nazarite. All right, you're with me. So the, the story of the Nazarite shows up in Numbers chapter 6. I don't have time to take you through all the text, but there's something incredible that God does in the law. He is establishing that in order to worship him, there is a holy and proper way to approach him, respect him, honor him. And he has established a class of priests whose assignment it is, is to manage those things so that God is worshiped in a way that is honoring to him, blessing to him, and, uh, and is setting an example for the people. And so that's the priestly class. And the priests have kind of the responsibility of going into the presence of God on behalf of the people. They do the priestly duties, but they also get the priestly experience of being in the presence, come on now, of God. And so in Numbers chapter 6, God says there's a way that an other person can get a priestly experience, not the priestly responsibilities, but the priestly intimacy with God. And he establishes what's called a Nazarite vow. And he says, if you choose for a season to be set apart for God, sanctified, holy, put in a position where you can hear from God, there's a few things you can covenant with God to do. And if you choose to do that, you are, you, and so this is what, this, oh man, how nerdy can I get on this amount of time? So, so the word Nazir, right? The word Nazir um, is where Nazarite comes from. It's also the Hebrew word for crown. And, uh, and so, so Samson's gonna have an issue with his head. Come on now, with his hair. The priest would wear a Nazir, a crown, that said set apart on it. it. Also, it's a word that starts with T's, the tishvi that they also say, but, but, uh, but that's too nerdy. So we're going to stay at Nazir. And, and they wore a crown that said set apart. And the reason they did that is because when they walked into the presence of God and he looked down on them, he wanted to see that they had intentionally been set apart from the world before they showed up into his presence. And so, so God establishes for the Nazarite some boundaries that will help him be set apart from the world, him or her, come on now, be set apart from the world so that they can enter into the presence of God. So there's three things. Numbers chapter six lays out. You can read it yourself, but it says abstain from wine or grapes. It says you're not gonna drink and then get into my presence that way. I just want you to know the priests did drink. They just didn't drink when it was time to get into the presence of God. And so this wasn't like an abolition of the act. This was wisdom. If you're gonna get into the presence of God, that they would do that, right? No razor on their head. Come on now. They would have a covering on their head that they committed to for that time. And then they would not go near a dead body. They would not touch things that were defiled, unclean, and then get into, come on now, the presence of God. So this is what's beautiful about our God. Our God, God, from the very beginning, sometimes we look at the Old Testament, we think, oh, that's a different God than in the New Testament. From the very beginning, he was creating access to him for everybody. 
He wanted people to experience his presence that wanted to get into his presence. And so that's what the Nazarite vow was all about. So now you know Samson, you know that he's someone who experiences this Nazarite vow. And uh, as we get into his story, I want you to know Samson's life starts with a vision. Samson's life starts with a vision. So I'm going to get in Judges uh, chapter 13. Because of time, I'm going to skip through the story a little bit. Will you allow me to skip through? It's like four chapters, three chapters. I can read fast. I talk fast, but, uh, but I can summarize a little bit faster. So I'm going to let you, I'm gonna let you read and check on, on, on Pastor Mike and make sure I was telling the truth to you. Verse 13, chapter 13, verse 1, the story starts, and it says, Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. Yikes. I just want you to set the stage so you know what's happening. The Israelites have been delivered into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. The Philistines are an interesting enemy. The Philistines, um, they were a seafaring people. Their fish god, Magog, was like a, you know, they, they traveled. And so they had access to technology because they traveled by sea to different cities and places faster than the Jews had access to, to technology. So we're at like the end of the Bronze Age. The Iron Age is about to start. And they have better weapons, better tools, better technology than the people that they are conquering. So when they come into the scene, they're scary, their weapons don't break when they clash against each other. Their, their technology is a little bit more advanced. But their model of conquering people was a very interesting model. What they did is they didn't come in and wipe you out. What they did is they came in and just merged with your culture. They defeated you, but then they married you. They defeated you, and then they lived among you. And then they said, hey, we don't need you to leave your God. We just need you to also worship our God. We need you to find a way, come on now, to just worship God with a little bit more division. Just make some space in your worship to allow a little outside influence. You know that's not cool, but you know, come on. We're trying to get along. Just go along to get along, guys. And here's what's crazy. In every story up until this point in the text, the people cry out because of the oppression that they're experiencing. But in this story, they never cry out. God raises up Samson because they're not crying out. They've gotten so comfortable. They're now complicit with this lifestyle of, yeah, we got God, but we also got this on the side. We're also just compromising and doing this on the side. Isn't it interesting sometimes that the people of God find a way to compromise? And they go, yeah, you know, I, don't, I really want to make a stink right now. I, don't, I mean, come on, man. Like, everything's all hard anyways. Like, why, like, why let's not be that thing that sticks out. Let's just go along to get along. And God looks at that and he goes, oh, there's a trap here that's just too dangerous. I'm going to have to raise up someone, a Nazarite, who understands you got to be set apart if you want to experience my presence and my power. So here comes Samson. So we get into the story. Uh, I'm going to skip up to chapter, the end of the chapter verse 24, and then get into Samson's life. Samson's mom, she can't have a kid. We could get into that text. It's powerful. She does. She gives him to the Lord. She gives birth to him. Verse 24, named Samson. He grew, and the Lord blessed him. Verse 25, and the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him while he was in Manahedan between Zorah and Eshtal. So God's Spirit is on him. He is a Nazarite set apart for God, and now we're going to hear some of his story. Verse 1 uh, of chapter 14. It says, Samson went down to Timnah, and there he saw a young Philistine woman. When he returned, he said to his father and mother, I have seen a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now go get her for me as a wife. This is how you know he's a teenager. <laughs> Let's go. He didn't talk to her. He didn't have no conversation. He's walking along, and he's like, mmm, that one. That's the one. Go get her for me as a wife. Where does he put his eyes? Verse 3, his father and mother replied, uh, isn't there an acceptable woman among your relatives or among all of our people? Must you go to the uncircumcised Philistines to get a wife? But Samson said to his father, go and get her for me. She's the right one for me. Man, I was a youth pastor for a long time. If I had a dollar for every time I heard this conversation, I come on now, I could have I been a, a very happily retired pastor by now. She's the right one for me. He's the right one for me. Well, you know, can't you find someone who maybe has your values? No, she's the one. Look at her. Have you talked to her? No. No, that's scary. But she's the one, pastor. Come on now, church. Go and get her for me, he says. 
The family doesn't understand that God is provoking a fight here because he recognizes they've become too comfortable. You see, Samson has a dilemma here. He's falling in love with something he's supposed to be at war with. This is what happens when we start setting our eyes on things that aren't in the plan or in the will of God. We start falling in love with things that we're supposed to be at war with, church. So Samson walks right into a trap. He's literally giving his heart away. Uh, where am I? Verse 5. So Samson went down to Timnah together with his father and his mother. And as they approached the vineyards of Timnah, suddenly a young lion came roaring towards him. Like, holy moly, this story is like, how fun is this story? He's like, go get her for me. And he said, walking, he's walking. And a lion just literally just jumps out. I, I mean, like, this is the end of the story. Good story. They're done. Verse 6 says, though, but the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him so that he tore the lion apart with his bare hands as he might have torn a young goat. Come on now. But first of all, I didn't grow up in the country. I grew up in Antioch. Let's go. But I ain't never seen a goat that you could just tear apart with your bare hands. So, so I, I'm just, I'm immediately impressed that that's the easy thing right? But not only is that the easy thing, he takes on this lion and he rips it apart. But he told neither his father nor his mother what he had done. And he went down to the town and he talked with the woman and he liked her. You know, I was reading this text and it, it struck me how often we're on a journey trying to go where we think we're supposed to go, even when we're messed up. And it's like the enemy sets traps for us along the way. And there's lions that spring up out of nowhere you're just cruising along on a regular Tuesday and you get a phone call and you're like, hey, it's the doctor, you gotta come in. You get a call and it's your mom and she says, hey, your dad's sick. You get a call and it's the school, come on now, and they say, you gotta come pick up your kid. And I think sometimes we get frustrated at a life that's interfered with by lions. But I saw something in the text here that leapt out off the page at me the same way this lion leapt out at, Sam, at Samson. Up until this point, we don't have any indication that Samson has any power at all. It's the lion that shows him he's powerful. It's the lion that shows him that God's with him. It's the lion that shows him that being set apart from God has actually established power and authority in his life. If it's not for the lion, he doesn't know his strength. I wonder sometimes if the lions in your life aren't allowed to come into that space so that you can see the strength that God's been building in you as you've been set apart for him. You may be unaware of just how resilient you are, just how deep your roots have begun to grow. You may not know what kind of authority you have in spiritual places until some spiritual attack shows up. So don't get so upset every time a lion comes up and come crying to Elliot and be like, why are the lions coming? He's going to look at you and he's going to say, how strong are you in your faith right now? How much power is God able to impart into you? How set apart have you been so that you're prepared for what's unpreparable? Because you're trusting God. It's the lion that shows you how strong you are. Maybe if I stopped right there, that'd be good, but I got a lot more. I'm going to summarize for a little bit here because I'm going to get in the text for a long time. Samson goes down. He meets the girl. The father uh, arranges the marriage. The ceremony is supposed to happen. They uh, are hanging out. And they're doing the, the, the bachelor party, right? It's like a week-long bachelor party. He's meeting all her relatives, and he's talking smack. He's feeling pretty good. He's a teenager. He just ripped the lion apart. As he's walking by the lion, he notices uh, the carcass of it, that there's honey in there. And he's like, that's cool. He eats some of the honey. And so he's thinking, like, I want to brag about what I did, but I got a humble brag. I can't just say, hey, guys, I ripped the lion apart. So he says, I I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pose a riddle for you guys. And if you can answer my riddle, I'll give you 30 sets of clothes. If you can't, you got to give me 30 sets of clothes. And they're like, okay, what's your riddle? And he says, out of the, out of the strong, something sweet, right? And they're like, we don't know what you're talking about. That's a weird riddle, guy. So for three days, they try to guess, and they can't guess. And he's like, I know something you don't know. I can't wait to tell you. I ripped the line apart. Well, they go to his soon-to-be wife, and they're like, hey, man, your uh, husband's trying to rob us with his little riddle tricks. You got to find out the answer, or we're going to take it out on you. So she goes to him, and she's like, you won't even tell me the answer. He's like, I haven't told my mom and dad. He's like, you know how old he is, right? He's like, I haven't even told mom. And then she starts crying. Come on, girls. You know the power of those tears, and you use it. I'm just going to tell you the truth. It's in the story. We are powerless to resist. 
Samson's wife threw herself on him, sobbing, verse 16. You hate me. You don't really love me. Come on, teenager. You've given my people a riddle, but you haven't told me the answer. I haven't explained it to my father or mother. He said, so why should I explain it to you? Verse 17. She cried the whole seven days of the feast. Come on. Yikes. Don't sanitize the story. This is annoying. She is whining and crying. You don't even love me. So he finally told her because she continued to press him. She in turn explained the riddle to her people. They come to him and they know the answer. He knows how they knew the answer. So he's fired up, ball of testosterone. He goes into town, beats up 30 people, takes their clothes, pays the, pays the dues. But now he's ticked, so he goes back home without his wife. He leaves for a season. Then he cools down and he's like, well, I guess I got to go pick up my wife now. And this is where we pick up the story. He shows back up, but something has happened. The father of the bride saw how mad he was and was like, well, he ain't coming back. And I got to marry this daughter off now because she's been hanging out with Samson. No one's going to want her. Let me just give her to one of the groomsmen. Oops. Fellas, I don't know if you can imagine that scenario where your bride ends up with one of your groomsmen. But that's the level of hostility that Samson is feeling when he shows back up. I'm in chapter 15 now, verse 2. The dad says, I was so sure you hated her that I gave her to your companion. Isn't her younger sister more attractive? Just take her instead. Whoa. I'm not sanitizing the story for you guys. This is what's happening in the text. Samson said to them, this time I have a right to get even with the Philistines. Come on now. And a left. I'm really going to harm them. I'm really going to harm them. If I had time, we'd talk a little bit about the spirit that gets in us that says, I'm really going to harm them. Oh, you wronged me? <laughs> Thanks for giving me permission. I'm going to make your life real hard now. Oh, you offended me? You hurt my feelings? You did, you did me. I'm really going to harm you now. How many of the worst decisions in your life started with some nonsense justification? Like, well, they did this to me. This is what they get. Talking to church people. We are not exempt. This is our story. This is our text. This becomes a bit of a theme in his life. Oh, you did this to me? Look what I'm going to do back to you. Story gets crazy from here. Um, if I had time, I'd take us through, but we got to get to the, like, the sweet spot of the story. I mean, he, th this guy is tying foxes' tails together, putting a torch in between them and throwing them in the crops. He's literally like getting himself tied up, marching into the enemy's camp with a thousand people, breaking the bonds, grabbing the jawbone of a donkey, and beating a thousand men to death with a jawbone of a donkey. And then he's talking smack, saying, I beat you up with the jawbone of a donkey. You all are donkeys. I'm like, that's Samson. There's some fire going on in him. Read the text. And I didn't do the King James Version. I don't know if there's kids in here. It's kind of dark. But he used the jawbone of something. And he took them out. Chapter 15, verse 20 then says that Samson led Israel for 20 years in the days of the Philistines. Did you know that? This is a story that's taken 20 plus years to unfold. Here's what struck me about this is Samson has not grown up. Samson has not dealt with his divided heart. He has not dealt with the wound that he experienced when he gave his heart to someone he shouldn't give his heart to, when he let a little compromise get into his life, and now he's in charge for 20 years. Yikes. Yikes. Can I say something to you guys? I've been saying this uh, for a few weeks now, and so I, I just feel passionately. I feel like the Lord is just speaking this to me, and I'm speaking it to church people wherever they will listen to me. There is a danger in church world where you can go to church for 20 years and still be one year old in your faith. Yeah. Never grow up. Never mature. You keep coming back, but you're not dealing with the stuff you need to deal with. You're not giving God the things you need to give him. You're not willing to step into maturity to faith. You're not willing to grow up and mature in the Lord. We got an epidemic in the church of people who are real faithful to show up, but they won't grow up. Samson's got a 20-year run here, and the next time we see him in chapter 16, verse 1, he is the man appointed to be set apart to God, to lead the people of God. And in chapter 16, verse 1, he's just hanging out with prostitutes. <laughs> yeah! Do you 
you see what I'm saying? He's not matured. He's not dealt with the wound. He's not been answerable to God, accountable to God. For 20 years, he's been in charge of the people of God, and he hasn't been willing to grow up, to mature, to deal with the wounds. And then we meet our favorite side character in this narrative. We're going to meet Delilah. We're going to meet Delilah. In chapter 16, beginning of verse 4, it says, Sometime later, he fell in love with a woman. Come on now. This story we've seen in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. The rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, uh, See if you can lure him into showing you the secret of his great strength, so that we can overpower him and we may tie him up and subdue him. Each one of us will give you 1,100 shekels of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, Tell me the secret of your great strength and how you can be tied up and subdued. Um, <laughs> I, I, I got to be honest with you. I have this picture in my head of Delilah having guile and being like sweet and like, you know, but she just, she just says it. She's like, I already got your heart. You already are doing what you know you shouldn't be doing. Your defenses are down. You are not really maturing. Your faithfulness to God is compromised. Let's just see how far you'll go. Tell me the secret of your great strength and how you can be tied up and how you can be subdued. I can't imagine the amount of compromise that has to be in your life to go to bed with someone who is confessing they want to kill you. Go to bed with someone who is confessing they want to kill you. Yeah, we see this in our lives all the time. We commit our lives and spend time with things we know want to kill us. We know it wants to kill us. And we're like, ah, whatever. Let's just go to bed with it. Let's just live with it. She is saying, tell me how to destroy you. And he's like, yeah, let's hang out. You know, <laughs> she, he knew that she was trying to seduce him out of her secrets. If you, if you read in the text, she's going she's gonna to ask him three times. He's going to lie. He's going to say, oh, tie me up with fresh bowstrings, and I'll be like any other man. And then, and, you know, I'll be weak. And so she ties him up. And he wakes up and she's like, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. And men with swords run in to kill him. And he's like, Ugh! and he breaks them and he whoops them all up and then kicks them out. And then she's like, you lied to me. <laughs> are you serious? Think about what has to be going on in your heart to make that compromise. It's a pretty incredible journey to go on. There's a professor from Duke called Dan Airely. He wrote a book called The Honest Truth About Dishonesty how we lie to everyone. And he talks in this book about something that he calls the what the hell effect. The what the hell effect. And here's what he says. He says, what happens in us is we start making little compromises. Yeah, you know, I came in a little bit late, but I fudged my time card. Yeah, you know, I, uh, uh, I wasn't quite as honest on my taxes as I should have been. Ah, you know, I was here, but I told her I was here. But, you know, if she knew I was here, she might be mad. So I'm just going to tell her I was here. Uh, you know, I, I didn't do the thing I said I was going to do. But I, and, and, and so what ends up happening is our dishonesty, our sin, it disintegrates us. It separates our soul. And we begin to just tolerate things that we would never tolerate. As a matter of fact, in his study, what he goes on to say is, is this is something that ends up becoming cultural. It becomes community-wide. We start to make little concessions by our actions and by our inactions, church. We see a need, and pretty soon we're like, man, there's so many needs. And we look away, and we just begin to disintegrate our, our, our soul. And he says, this is the what the hell effect. And he goes, this is the effect that eventually gets us to say, you know what? I mean, I've really been in a fight with her for so long anyways. Our hearts are already separated. I'm not the kind of person who would ever cheat, but what the hell? It's only one more step from where we're already at. I'm not the kind of person who would be violent. I'd never raise my hands to them. But you know what? What the hell? I'm just going to go a little bit, a little bit farther, a little bit farther, a little bit farther. And we see in Samson's life, he started with vision. 
He was set apart from God. He's got a crown over his head. He's got an assignment to free the people of God who have been imprisoned by this culture that's just submerging them with, with with their values that are taking them away from God. He starts with a vision and pretty soon he gets division. He's like, well, can I just, can I just make a compromise? Can I just be married and in love with a thing I'm supposed to destroy and be separated from? And, and, and it stunts his growth. He carries a wound that he never deals with. And eventually he finds himself in bed with a thing that wants to destroy him saying, this is how you take me out. After three times, he tells her the truth. He goes, I'm pretty sure it's my hair. She's like, oh, well, let's give him a haircut. She cuts his hair. She calls the men in. They come charging in, and he thinks, oh, I'm going to whoop these guys again. This is a fun game we're playing, only he's not strong anymore. He's no longer been set apart. And they hold him down, and they bind him, and they gouge out his eyes, and they throw him in prison, and they bring him out, and they mock him. He starts with a vision. He gets to vision, and he ends up with no vision. He has no eyes. Guys, this is, this is what happens when we allow compromise when we refuse to be set apart when we try to make peace with things that we shouldn't be making peace with in our lives and we don't want to bring them to God and we stay stunted in our growth and 20 years go by and we never deal with any of the stuff we just don't deal with it we're not willing to go to that place and the what the hell effect takes over our lives And we find ourselves with no vision. (laughs) This is too good. I have to read this part of the text. I summarized it, but in chapter 16, verse 15, she says, How can you say I love you when you won't confide in me? This is the third time you've made a fool of me and you haven't told me the secret of your great strength. Verse 16, I just love this. I underlined it in my my text. But with such nagging, she prodded him day after day until he was sick to death with it. The enemy is using the old tricks from our childhood to just bring us back. Come on now. Be careful what you let annoy you. Some of the biggest mistakes of your life, you just finally got annoyed. You did the wrong thing. You let it get in your heart. You let it get in your mind. You kept obsessing over it. You kept clicking on that link and reading that thing and looking at their life and figuring out how frustrated you were and letting it get in your mind and get in your head and get in your heart and get you bitter and snagging at you and snagging at you and snagging at you. You did the dumb thing. Be careful what you let in your heart. That's why the scripture says, above all else, guard your heart. He didn't. He didn't lose his strength when he lost his hair. He lost his strength when he finally gave his heart away. He finally gave his heart away. She nagged him to the point of death, and he's like, fine, here's my whole heart. I just give up on all the things that God had for me, the plan he had for me, the destiny he had for me, the vision he had for me. I'll just give it up. You've nagged me to death. It's too much work. It's too much difficulty. I haven't wanted to take the steps to deal with any of the stuff, and so fine, have your way. It's a pretty tragic story. Say, Pastor, help us. We need to be encouraged. It's Wednesday night. I got to get through the rest of this week. <laughs> Let's read the rest of the story. Where am I at here? Let's go to um, verse 20. I'm skipping ahead a little bit here. So then she called Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He woke from his sleep and thought, I'll go outside like before, I'll shake myself free. But he didn't know the Lord had left him. Then the Philistines seized him gouged out his eyes, took him down to Gaza, binding him with bronze shackles. They set him to grinding the grain in the prison. Verse 22. But the hair on his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. He's compromised. He's stuck in the redemption cycle. Come on, he thinks he's in the sin cycle, but God thinks he's in the redemption cycle. God is looking down at him, and he has put himself in a situation where he cannot pick himself back up. He has no vision, but the hair on his head is starting to grow back. The promise of God is starting to show up in his life again. The goodness of God is starting to show up. Some of you have been feeling like you've been far from God for so long, and the word of God would just want to remind you the hair can grow back. Not for me, but for you. Come on now, church. The hair can grow back. The promise of God is still available when he gets outside of the storm, when he's at his lowest moment, when he's no longer ruling and he's no longer compromising. He's now enslaved and at his weakest moment, when he's grinding grain in the meal, thinking about his life, God starts growing back the hair. 
the promise of God is still available to him. It's still available to you. The hair grows back. The hair grows back. God is still using imperfect people like Samson today. The hair grows back. No matter what a disaster you've made of your life, no matter how long you've been sitting in one place and not growing, no matter how long you've been carrying a wound, damage from your youth, love that went unrequited, mistakes that you made, compromises that you did, the hair can grow back, church. It grows back. The promise of God, the set-apartness to him is still available for you and for me. Verse 29, the end of the story. Samson says, put me between the pillars, O God, and use me one more time. It says, then Samson reached out to the two central pillars where the temple stood, embracing himself against them, his right hand on one, his left hand on the other. He says, let me die with the Philistines. And he pushed with all his might, and down came the temple on the rulers and all the people in it. And thus he killed many more when he died than when he lived. Come on now. He goes out strong powerful, used by God, accomplishing his destiny because the hair grew back. Would you stand with me? I'm at our time, but I want to pray for you and with you. I'm sorry I made the story of Samson a little messier than maybe you remember it. We had some fun. We told some jokes along the way. We got into the story and the narrative and the power of those moments, and we saw the heart the redemptive arc of Jesus show up. You know, Samson had to take a Nazarite vow in order to operate in the priestly duties. Jesus tore the veil that separates us from the presence of God. And Peter told us that we're a royal priesthood, a chosen generation, a people belonging to God. We have that access to his presence all the time, even if you can't grow. Come on now, church, some hair. But some of you in the house, I think, tonight just needed to hear that the hair can grow back. You've been, in a, you've been in a mess. The hair can grow back. Some of you just need to know that, like, you've been living with some division. And the end of that road is way further from God than you expected it to be. And you thought you were going to drift just so far. But the enemy was like, yeah, pushing you over here. And God's calling you back. You can't live your life with division. Because the end results, come on now, no vision. Some of you are just praying for a vision. God, give me a vision. Where I'm supposed to go, what I'm supposed to do, how I'm supposed to serve. Can I just be like really blunt with you? Can you just go to growth track? Come on now, church. Can you just, can I, can you just give your pastor an opportunity to speak some life in you and hear some story? Can you, just, can you just start getting out of that one year stuck phase for 20 years mode and start moving into maturity and he, learning how to hear the voice of God? Just practical. He can't say that as, as bluntly as I can um, in his house. He can come to my house and say it, but in his house, I can just say it. Come on now, church. Let's go. We're going to take an offering. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm I'm sorry. I'm going to take us out of that, out of the moment. I'm sorry. I just, I can't, I'm just, I mean, I'm just having too much fun with my friend here. I want to pray for you, and I know you're, you're likely in one of those spots, and you're wrestling. God, give me fresh vision for this season. God, I confess to division. I know I've let some things in my life I haven't resolved and I've been comfortable with them. I'm going to bed with things that want to kill me. I need to get them out. Some of you have been like, I have no vision anymore. I don't even know. I don't even know. You just need to hear the, the hair grows back. Holy Spirit, would you be the counselor you promised to be? Would you bring the comfort you promised to, com- to comfort the way you'd promised to do it in this moment? Would you help us to go from disintegrated people who have allowed compromise and sin to divide our spirit, our soul? Would you bring us to a place of wholeness and authenticity before your throne? You work through some messy, immature rascals in the scripture and you preserve those stories so we can see hope for ourselves. And you're the same God. 
not enamored with some sin cycle, look at how bad we are, but, but trying to display a redemptive cycle so that we'll know your character and your heart and that it's available to us, this hope, if we'll just cry out to you, if we'll just call out to you. Oh God, we call out to you. Help us, give us vision. Father, we repent and turn away from our division. The one who brings dead things to life, would you breathe life where there's no vision? Would the hair grow back, I pray. Have your way in us. In the holy name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. And amen. And amen. Thank you, church.